praise you and we come to worship you just in authenticity just as we are we don't have to come with any kind of preconceived ideas of what worship is we can just be ourselves so god just um bless us this morning as we come together to worship in your holy name amen
Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for this way. My story isn't over, and my story's just begun. Fail you on to find me, that's what my father does. Fail you on to find me. by this service. We're here for you, Lord. All of this is for your glory. And we just praise you. We lift you up this morning. And we're here to worship you, Father. Uh, this next song is just a beautiful reminder of your love. And, and your love has already won, Father. And we thank you so much for that. We don't have to worry about anything. Your love has already won for us. And we thank you for that. Amen. 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 Hallelujah, no. 
sometimes on this side of heaven. Oh, it just doesn't make sense. That's why he gave us this family with the promise that nothing can break. And one day we'll all be together. Please be seated. What is such a joy to see all kinds of signs of new life in this church. Who was here for the Thanksgiving dinner last night? It was an incredible dinner. We had um, uh, lots of people here. I want to thank, who, who, uh, who was here to volunteer with the dinner? Thank you for all of your help. It was an incredible event. You know, it's been about two years since we've had a dinner here in the fellowship hall, so to see that life there last night was just encouraging and wonderful. So thank you to Lisa, thank you to all the volunteers who, who helped with that. Another sign of uh, new life in our church is we're receiving new members this morning, and it was such a joy to be um, in this um, kind of new members class over the past several weeks with, uh, with our new members. So I'd like to ask uh, David Scholes to come forward. And we're praying for Eileen, who's actually uh, just um, had an appendectomy. So Eileen can't be with us this morning. But Dave, would you come forward? And John and Don Snowden, and Brianna and Avery, and Laura Kelly with Jennifer and Jessica, if they're here. And Janine Sloth, if Janine's here with uh, Alex and Katie. And Sarah Leonard, would you step forward, please? <laughs> So um, it's a wonderful moment when, um, when we receive new members into the congregation. God's church is, uh, is uh, still growing. The kingdom is still growing. And, um, and that's inspirational. Um, part of what we're going to be doing this morning is an affirmation of faith, a public pro proclamation of faith. Um, because the reason that's important is we are not Christians in isolation. We, are, we cannot be Christian in isolation. It's not just a title that we have. We can't sit at home and watch Zoom and think that that's part of the church. Those of you who are watching on Zoom, if you need to be home because of some you know, pre-existing conditions, by all means, uh, please stay with us on Zoom. But that can't be a permanent solution. That's not the church. We cannot be Christian in isolation. We are Christians when we come together as the body of Christ. And so part of what we do this morning as... Um, as we proclaim our faith together, and uh, what I'll be doing in a moment is asking the new members to proclaim their faith publicly before you, 
And then we'll all stand and we'll say the Apostles' Creed, and that's all of us together as a church proclaiming our faith together. And that's important because we are the body of Christ together. Let's pray. God, we thank you for these new members that are interested in joining the church. God, we pray that your church will be strengthened today and increased, and that your name will be glorified here in this sanctuary, but also among all of your people, both in the church and in the world. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The elders of the Hope World Reformed Church have welcomed these candidates for membership who appeared before them and made their profession of Christian faith with us. David Scholes, John and Don, John and Don Snowden, Laura Kelly, Sarah Leonard, and Janine Sloat. These friends have all been baptized into the body of Christ. In making public this profession of their faith, they affirm the meaning of their baptism. We ask them now to declare their faith before God and Christ's church that we may rejoice together and welcome them as brothers and sisters in Christ. So friends, I ask you, do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as your rule for faith and life? And do you, relying on the grace of God, promise to confess Christ publicly before others, to serve Christ daily, and to walk in Jesus' way? And do you promise to exhibit the joy of life in Christ, to share fully in the life of the church, to be faithful in attendance of worship and service, and to offer your prayers and your gifts? And do you promise to accept the spiritual guidance of the church, to walk in a spirit of Christian love with this congregation, and to seek the things that make for unity, purity, and peace? Amen. Amen. And will the members of the congregation please stand? Do you promise to love, encourage, and support these brothers and sisters by supporting them with the gospel of God's love, by being an example of Christian faith and character, and by giving the strong support of God's family in fellowship, prayer, and service? And let us read together the, the Apostles' Creed, which is projected on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks and praise. We thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, who has overcome sin, and has brought us to yourself through his death and resurrection. We thank you for sealing us with your Holy Spirit and for binding us to Christ and his service. We thank you for the covenant that you make with all of your servants. And as your grace has drawn David and Eileen and John and Don and Laura and Sarah and Janine to you, continue, God, to strengthen them and their children. By your Holy Spirit, increase in them your gifts by the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the reverence of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence. God, this morning, we also pray for Brianna and Avery, and Jennifer and Jessica and Sonia and Alex and Katie, that you would bless them as they grow in faith. And all these things we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now will you please... Join me in welcoming our brothers and sisters with the words printed on the screen. And let us say together, joyfully we receive you. Join with us as we give witness in the world to the good news 
for we are all one in Christ Jesus. Alleluia. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Okay, you can be seated, but why don't you children, why don't you guys sit uh, here, because we're going to do the children's message next. So um, I have a question. Who can tell me? And actually, um, Will, if you want to come down too, if any other children want to come down, or you can stay in your seats. So who can tell me what a king or queen wears on their head? The type of jewelry? Exactly, yep. A crown or a tiara? Very, very good, yes. Excellent. Um, I want to show you a few pictures of crowns from kings and queens around the world. And what you're going to notice as I show you these pictures is that they're all so different. Every one of them looks different, but there's something that every single one of them has in common. So as we look at these pictures, think about that. What do these crowns have in common? And when we're done looking at the pictures, I'll ask you that question. What do they have in common? Okay, so let's look at the first one. This one is from Cambodia. This is, this is the crown of the king of Cambodia. Um, actually, the king today, um, I don't think actually wears it, but has it next to the uh, throne. So that's, isn't that interesting how that crown looks from Cambodia? This next, this is from Indonesia. The king from Indonesia wears this crown. Interesting, huh? See the jewels on this crown? And it has a different shape than that other crown had. Okay, this one, this crown is from the kingdom of, it's called Selangor, Selangor. And it's actually a sultan, which is the same thing as a king. And that's the crown that he wears. This is, it's not exactly a crown, it's, um, it's called a kuma, it's a, it's a turban. And this is what the king of Oman wears, the sultan of Oman. And actually, that's, if you can go back one slide, that is very expensive um, fabric. It's so expensive, it's purple royal fabric, and uh, only the royal family can wear that fabric. And uh, so that's what the king in Oman wears. Anybody know who this is? Who's this? That's Queen Elizabeth II, right. And she's wearing the, the crown of the, um, of the nation, the kingdom of uh, England. She's the queen of England. And um, by the way, anybody know what that crown costs? How much is that worth? What would you guess? How much money is that worth? Really close. It's actually higher. 20,000, it's higher. It's even higher than 20 million. It's 39 million dollars that crown is worth. That's a lot of money. So, um, looking at all of those crowns that we just saw, what do you think they have in common? They all have gold in them. They all have gold. Yep, yeah, that's. They all have like the 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 parts of the Yeah, good point. They all have something kind of sticking up from the crown as part of the crown. They all have diamonds, some sort of like precious jewels, yep. Did you have an idea? All of them, right? All of them are expensive. They're really expensive crowns. Now Jesus, we call Jesus our king. Jesus, did he have a crown? Actually, he did have a crown. Does anybody know what his crown was made of? Leaves? Very close. Yeah, very close. Branches, some kind of branches. I think that it was one of those That's exactly right. It says in the Bible that they twisted together a crown of thorns and they placed it on his head and they began to mock him. And so this, this was the crown that Jesus had. Now what's the difference between this and the kind of crowns we just saw? It's just branches. How much do you think this costs? It doesn't cost anything. We could go in our backyard and clip this. By the way, I have 
prickers in my backyard that are as sharp as this crown of thorns. Um, that's exactly right. It doesn't cost anything. You know, Jesus um, it was a different kind of king. Most kings are rich, but Jesus was poor. Most kings have servants, a whole bunch of servants, but Jesus said we need to be a servant to others. Most kings were expensive crowns, but Jesus' crown was humble. And he said in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, if you want to become great, you must be a servant of all. And if you want to be first, you must be what? Very good, yes, kind, loyal, understandable, and also last. And you have to be there for your people. Very good, yeah. And then he said, for I did not come to be served, but I came to serve others and to give my life away to save other people. And Jesus gave his life to save us. So he was a different kind of king. Let us pray. Hold your hands. Close your eyes and bow your head. Dear God, we thank you for sending us a different kind of king. We thank you for giving us King Jesus and making him our king. God, help us to be good servants of the king, Jesus, and help us to obey his teachings and to, to serve others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, you can go to your Sunday school rooms. So there are a few announcements this morning. Um, I want to just thank Nelson and Sue for the incredible job they did on the crop walk last week. Thank you. And thanks to all the volunteers. Those of you who saw it, it was, it was phenomenal. I mean, there were, there were different stations with information, teaching about water resource issues and food security issues around the world. And there was this amazing garbage display back here talking about garbage. and. It was an incredible display, and it was like a five-kilometer walk around uh, the church property. So great job. Thank you so much. And what did we, we ended up raising just under 3,000, I think. Is that right? For, um, and that will go to uh, the crop organization with Church World Service, and that goes to Defeating Hunger. So thank you for all your work on that. Uh, the fall cleanup day is coming up on November 20th, so um, please contact Will Jackson for more information about that, or you can contact Birgit in the church office to sign up. Uh, that's going to be from 8 a.m. to noon on November 20th, and we really need as many people here as possible, because that's the day when we clean up all the leaves. And um, so, uh, Percy, I'll see you there. <laughs> I'm bringing my leaf blower, by the way. Um, congregational meeting is going to be on November 21st. We'll be uh, electing new um, consistory members, so we'll be um, on the slate for elder is Charlotte Garrison, Chris Snyder's on the slate for deacon, Kim Warner is on the slate for deacon, and uh, then we also have a, um, an agenda which will probably take about 45 minutes to an hour for the congregational meeting, November 21st. That'll be directly after the second service. Also, just a reminder to send in your pledge cards. Um, we're, we're trying to collect uh, all the pledge cards so that we can plan for the budget, for the 2022 budget. So thank you for that. And let us continue our service of worship with our joys and concerns. Are there any concerns this morning? I'd like to ask for continued prayers for Barbara Legrand, for uh, Carol O'Malley's brother-in-law, Greg Fox. Please pray for... Um, Eileen, who is uh, recovering at home after uh, an appendectomy. Please pray also for uh, Scott Quimby, who just, uh, who's at home after, uh, after surgery this week. Also for um, Lisa, Elena Faust's uh, younger sister. Please pray for Ronnie Shepes's daughter, who is uh, newly pregnant. Please pray for... Kevin Phillips' mother, Patricia, who is, uh, is very ill right now. Please pray also for Eli and for Brian Beigert, who's struggling with long COVID symptoms. 
Any other prayer requests this morning? Yes. Oh, wow, okay. And he's your, your cousin who had throat cancer. So please pray for Andrew. I'm so sorry to hear that. Diane. So prayers for Diane's. Prayers for Diane's mother. Nelson. It's been a while. Please pray for Sarah. Nelson and Sue's daughter-in-law who's come down with COVID. So please pray for a boy in the Dominican and his healing. And we give thanks for that trip, the uh, Sowers of the Kingdom trip this past couple of weeks. Percy. Wow. Thank God for that. So uh, a joy for Percy's brother who was in a terrible accident, head on collision, and walked out without a scratch. Neil. So thanks for Neil's cataract surgery. And the reason I'm repeating this is for our friends on, on Zoom so everyone can hear. Thank you. Any other prayer requests? Yeah. So continued prayers for Avery who's struggling with anorexia. Pray for Julia, who just had a miscarriage. Any uh, requests from Zoom? Any other requests, prayer requests? This is also the Sunday after Veterans Day, and so I'd like to um, acknowledge our, our veterans this morning and say a prayer for anyone who's served in the armed forces and has served in a, in a conflict. We pray for our veterans. Let us pray. God, you've heard all of these concerns, all the names that we've just named. We pray this uh, prayer in a moment of silence to just lift up to you these names that were raised and, and also any other concern that, that's, uh, that we bring to you in our hearts. We, we pray silently now to you. God, as we come to you in worship and in prayer, we, um, we need to come authentically. We come just as we are, and you ask us to come in humility, confessing our sins, confessing the uh, things that we've done that we shouldn't have done, the things that we've left undone that we should have done, and also just the, the things in our thoughts and our natures that are out of line with your kingdom. So we spend a moment now just confessing before you. God, part of the foretaste of your kingdom here on earth is that we get to experience the joy of forgiveness, the joy that you promise you have completely removed our sins, wiped our slates clean, so we thank you, God, for the cleansing that you give to us, for the pardon that you give to us. God, this morning we ask blessings also on all those who have served in the armed forces. We ask for 
healing for the veterans who've been wounded in body and soul in conflicts around the globe. We pray especially for the young men and women who are coming home from Afghanistan with injured bodies and traumatized spirits, some of them. God brings solace to them. May we pray for them when they cannot pray. Have mercy, God, on our veterans from World War II, from Korea, from Vietnam, from Iraq, and from Afghanistan. Bring peace to their hearts and bring, bring peace to the regions that they fought in. May their calling continue to, to serve continue in their lives and find expression in new forms of service in our community and country. And we ask God that your kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven. Bring about the lasting peace that the world cannot give or take away, the eternal peace that puts an end to the need for war. We ask this through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us worship God with our tithes and offerings.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Our King comes to us with a thorn, crowns of thorn. He gives us everything. He is our king. We give back to him what he has given us in the life of our Jesus. Amen. As we open God's holy word this morning, let us pray. Gracious God, you are the giver of the word. Open our ears and our hearts. Open us to your teaching. Remind us that we are called to live in your kingdom, loving and trusting you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that we will not pass away. And his kingdom is the one that will never be destroyed. And a reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 29 through 32. Jesus said, do not keep striving for what you are to eat and what you are to drink. Do not keep worrying, for it is the nations of the world that strive after all these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, strive for his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Here is the reading of God's word for us this morning. May God help us as we seek to understand these words. Amen. So this is the second week in the sermon series on the kingdom of God. And again, in this passage in Luke, Jesus asks us to seek the kingdom. He also says it's God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. But what exactly does that mean? What is it that we are supposed to be seeking? And we started that inquiry last week by um, talking about the form of government called a kingdom, because Jesus used that analogy for a reason. He talked about the particular form of government called a kingdom, and we talked about eight uh, points that every earthly kingdom has in common, and why that analogy applies to God's kingdom, and why is it that Jesus used that term? Why not another analogy? Why did he say, it's the kingdom of God has come? He didn't say, it's the democratic republic of God has come. He didn't say that the communist regime of God is near. He didn't say that the totalitarian autocracy, totalitarian autocracy of God is at hand. He did not say the anarchy of God is coming. He specifically said the kingdom of God is coming. And so we looked at those eight points last week. Kingdoms are headed by a king or a queen, so a sovereign, God is sovereign. A king has the power to make laws. God makes laws. A king has the power to judge and to pardon. God judges and pardons us. For a king owns all of the land and the boundary. Psalm 24 says, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. A king also owns the citizen, the citizens, so we belong to God. A king is a provider. A king is a protector. And a kingdom almost always is a dynasty, which usually hands down from uh, the mantle of authority, passes from father to firstborn son. And so we talked about those points and how they relate to the kingdom of God. This morning what I want to do is kind of a, a bit of an Old Testament Bible lesson because, uh, on what the kingdom of God is because Jesus means something very specific when he uses that term, kingdom of God. I mean, he's referring to earthly kingdoms and the analogy 
what that means with God, but he's also referring to something very specific in the Old Testament. So I want to talk about that for a minute and then get back to the question, how is it that we are supposed to seek this kingdom? So in the Old Testament, there are passages, many passages about God being more than just the God of the world, the God of the universe, um, the God of the Israelites. In the Old Testament, which is the, the narrative, the story of the Hebrew people, God is also a king. So God is God and governor, God and king. It says in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 15 and 16, I am the Lord, your holy one, the creator of Israel, your king. Psalm 97, verse 1 says, The Lord is king. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Psalm 99, verse 1 says, The Lord is king. Let the people tremble. And so we see references throughout the Old Testament that Yahweh, Yahweh was the Hebrew name for God, Yahweh is both God and king. We also see evidence throughout the Old Testament narrative that God is acting like a king. Kings, one of the things kings do also is they make covenants with other kings and with people, with subjects. And God, Yahweh, makes a covenant with Israel in Leviticus 26 Verses 12 and 13, God says, I will walk among you, I will be your God, and you shall be my people. I am your Lord, the one who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery. I have broken the bars of your yoke and made you walk upright. So there's the covenant that God has with the people of Israel. God is not going to impose God's kingship on the people. God covenants with us. us. We just saw a covenanting here with the new members. It's our choice to join that covenant. We also see evidence that Yahweh, God, gives the law through Moses to the Hebrew people. That's something that a king does, makes the laws. We see that Yahweh gives the land to the Hebrew people. That's something that a king does. God provides for them and protects them. That's something that a king does. In other words, God is king throughout the Old Testament. And eventually, the Hebrews, though, were not satisfied with that. They looked at the other nations and they said, well, the other nations, they get to have earthly kings. We want an earthly king. We want a real human king like the other nations. And so they petition God and God gives them, God grants them an earthly king. In 1 Samuel, it says, all the elders of Israel gathered together, came to Samuel at Ramah and said, appoint for us a king to govern us like other nations. So in the narrative of scripture, God permits the Israelites to have an earthly king But, interestingly, the king was a vice-regent of God. The king was a representative of God. In other words, Israel was a theocracy at that time. The human king was just a stand-in for God. So do you see where this is going? See where this is going? Jesus is what? As Jesus comes, right? He's king, the representative of God. Through the pages of the Old Testament and the writings of the prophets, we also see this hope for Messiah that gets expressed all the way, all all throughout that uh, narrative. And the Messiah, as it's defined, will be all things, all of the, the, the hope for all of the things that Israel wants, all wrapped into one person. The Messiah will be the vice regent of God, in other words, a representative of God on earth. The Messiah will be a king from the line of David to govern Israel. The Messiah will be a military liberator of the Hebrew people. The Messiah will be a judge, a high priest, and a king who is both ruler and God. And in fact, if we look at that term Messiah in the Old Testament, it's in Hebrew it's referred to as Melech Masiach. Melech is the Hebrew word for king. Masiach is the Hebrew word for Messiah. So Melech Masiach means king Messiah. So it's a king that they were waiting for. And part of what was so confounding to the uh, leaders of Israel when Jesus came and claimed to be the Messiah was that on the one hand, he seemed to be fulfilling so many of the prophecies about the Messiah, but on the other hand, he was preaching and teaching about a kingdom that was completely the opposite of what they expected of a Messiah. So that was not lining up for them. For example, um, they expected the Messiah would be a military ruler, a ruler with military might to defeat the occupying army of the Romans. But instead, Jesus said, love your enemies, pray for them. He was speaking about peace, so that didn't line up. 
The Hebrews were expecting a Messiah to rule with great status and power, but instead Jesus said, if you want status, if you want power, if you want to be great, you have to be what? A servant of all. And so that didn't line up. So the kingdom of God, as Jesus was defining it, looked very different from the kingdom of God as they were imagining it in some of those texts of the Old Testament. So that phrase, though, the kingdom of God, that was a messianic hope for Israel. That was Israel's hope for the Messiah. And we just, uh, as Kim just read from the book of Daniel, we see one of the passages that looks forward to the Messiah. I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven. This is, this is Daniel's vision. And he came to the ancient one, and he was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all people, nations, and languages would serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away. His kingship is one that will never be destroyed. And then here's another reference. I mean, these references are all throughout Scripture, but here's one from Isaiah that you've probably heard before, and we'll be reading this around Christmas time. Isaiah chapter 9, for to us a child has been born, to us a son has been given. Authority rests upon his shoulders. He's named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forward and forevermore. So you see these references are all throughout the Old Testament for this coming King Messiah. Now that last passage I just read, that was written 750 years before Jesus came. So there was a long period of time between the kind of proclamation of those prophecies and the coming of King Messiah. And the kingdom of God, when it finally comes, here's another way that it looks different because the Hebrews imagined that this would be God once again, the Messiah, a God-man governing Israel. But instead, instead, what happens is we see the categories of human categories like race, like nationhood, like national citizenship, like gender. All of those are temporal, unimportant human ways of dividing each other. And when the kingdom comes, we see the Apostle Paul talking about this in Galatians, there will be no longer Jew or Greek, in other words, no longer national identity. There will be no longer slave or free, no longer male or female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. So you see, we need need to understand the overall kind of broad brushstroke of the Bible in order to understand the narrative of what's happening here when Jesus comes as king. We, we can't just kind of pick out passages from the Bible and apply them to our lives. We've got to look at this meta-narrative. So I'm hoping that that helps you to shed some more light on what it means, what Jesus was referring to when he said the kingdom of God is at hand. He was talking about himself as king. The king is coming. It's a kingdom for all people and through all time. Okay, so that's the Bible lesson. Let's get back to the question which is, so how do we seek this kingdom? How do we enter it? Sign me up. In Romans chapter 14, verse 17, um, we see that Paul says the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking. In other words, it's not the things of this world. It's righteousness and peace and joy and the Holy Spirit. And that's very similar. He was reflecting what Luke said, what what, uh, Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink. Stop striving for those things. God knows you need those things. Stop striving for those things. Stop striving for the things of this earth. Stop looking down all the time at this corrupt earth. And and instead, look up. Then he says, do not be afraid, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you these things, to give you the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. And so what Jesus and the Apostle Paul are saying is that the kingdom of God can be experienced here and now on this earth. And we also know that it hasn't yet fully come. How do we know that? Because in the Lord's Prayer, we pray this every week, Jesus says, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, the kingdom has not fully come yet. It hasn't fully arrived yet. But it's not just in heaven. We can actually experience the joy of the kingdom here and now, so how do we do it? How do we experience it? The author John Ortberg said, the kingdom of God is less about getting you into heaven 
and more about getting heaven into you here on earth. So we enter this kingdom partly by making Jesus our king, by accepting his kingship. And what does that mean? That means receiving the pardon that he gives, truly believing that he's cleansed you and made you new, listening to his words, obeying his teachings. It means remembering, and this is maybe the main point, remembering who you are, remembering your identity. You, first and foremost, are a citizen of the kingdom of God. That's your identity. But we forget that. And we get so mired and stuck in the identity of this world. We have to remember who we are. Our true identity, you are a citizen of the kingdom of God, not a victim of the darkness of the kingdoms of planet Earth. You are an eagle, not a chicken. Have you, have you heard the story about the guy who, who uh, rescued an injured eagle, put it in his chicken coop? So this guy was, was hiking through the woods, and he, he found this eagle who had an injured wing, and he rescued it. And he took it home, and he put it in his chicken coop. And it took about a year, but he nursed this, nurtured this eagle back to health so that it could fly again, so its wing was healed. But during that year, the eagle started to think that it was a chicken. The eagle began to walk along the ground the way chickens do. The eagle began to peck at corn scratch on the ground the way chickens do. And the eagle began to perch on top of the crate at night, roosting with the other chickens the way chickens do, because they're elevated and up and away from the predators they're afraid of. Now that's crazy, a predator bird, the king of the sky, huddling with birds of prey, birds of the ground at night, but that's what the eagle was doing. And one day, this guy's friend was walking through his garden and he saw an eagle in his chicken coop. He said, is that an eagle in your chicken coop? And the guy said, yeah, that's, that's an eagle. I, I, um, I found him when I was hiking his wing was broken. I brought him back. I put him in the chicken coop. I've nursed him back to health, and now he can fly again. And I've been trying to release him. But, and what I'll do is I'll release him. But then at night, I find him roosting with the chickens again. He comes back into the chicken coop, and he roosts. He thinks he's a chicken. And his friend said, look, you're not doing it right. Let me release him. You've got you to actually make sure you've you got to throw him up in the air. You can't just release him. Here, watch. His friend took the eagle. He said, you've got to speak to it. He said, eagle, remember that you are an eagle. You are not a chicken. And he thrust him up in the air. And the eagle fluttered back down to the ground and resumed pecking pieces of corn on the lawn. The guy said, I told you. He thinks he's a chicken. He said, no, let me try something else. He got a ladder. He perched it up on the roof. He went, you know, climbed up on top of the roof, took the eagle, and he said, eagle, Remember that you are an eagle. You are the king of the sky. And he threw him as far as he could off of the roof, as high as he could. And the eagle fluttered down 20 feet to the ground and began pecking corn again on the lawn. The guy said, I told you, it's not going to work. He said, can I, can I borrow your eagle for a day? He said, sure. So the man took the eagle very early in the morning, drove to the mountains, drove to this huge steep cliff, just as the sun was rising, he could see the huge expanse of the valley below. And the man took the eagle, and he said, remember that thou art an eagle. When you use Old English, it makes, it makes more impact. Um, remember that thou art an eagle, and you are the king of the sky. Fly. Be what you are. Remember what you are. And he thrust him into the air, and the eagle started free-falling down into the valley and spinning. And in desperation, the eagle spread out his wings, but he was continuing to spin down, and his wings caught some air, and he swooped up, and the eagle began to glide in huge circles around and around, and the man watched as he went higher and higher and off into the distance, and the eagle never returned. You are an eagle, not a chicken. You are citizens in the kingdom of God, not citizens of planet Earth. Let us pray. God, help us to lift our heads and raise our gaze from the mud and the mire and the division of this earth. Help us to spread our wings and live in the knowledge that, you, that we are forgiven, that we are made to be co-creators with you, that we are anointed and coronated 
with the task of helping to build your kingdom on earth. God, that is our purpose. Remind us of it. And Jesus, you are our king, our long-expected Messiah. Make us citizens of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. times more like Jesus and less like ourselves. Remember that you are eagles. You are citizens in the kingdom of God. Go out serving God. And make Jesus your king. Amen.
have a wonderful day today. to have a reception for the new members. So just outside in the fellowship hall, please join us as we welcome them to Hopewell. Thank you.